Welcome back to the second lecture of my talk about quantitative studies of uh, Alexandrov theorem. So let me briefly recall that in the first lecture we discussed a lot about this classical uh, theorem by Alexandrov about constant mean curvature hypersurfaces and uh, in the Euclidean space. And let me recall you that the theorem is true also in the hyperbolic space and in the hemisphere. So in this uh, second lecture, I want to focus on a quantitative result. And um, roughly speaking, the, the statement is something like this one. So we want to characterize almost constant mean curvature under uh, appropriate hypothesis. Okay, so let me recall just uh, uh, some notation. So I will uh, indicate with mn plus one, either the Euclidean space or the hyperbolic space or the hemisphere. So the three uh, ambient space where the uh, original Alexandrov's theorem is true. And uh, of course, I will focus on closed hypersurface embedded in M plus one. And for closed, I will, um, I will refer to regular, connected, compact, and without boundary. Okay, so um, we already used this, but the embeddedness assumption implies that S, so our hypersurface is the boundary of a domain and uh, the regularity of the hypersurface implies that uh, the hypersurface satisfies a uniform touching ball condition. And we denote with rho s the uniform radius. So this means that uh, this is clear with the, with the picture. So we have our hypersurface as the, the domain omega, such that the boundary of, of omega is the hypersurface. And this uniform radius means that for every point in the hypersurface, we can find the two balls as in the picture. So one ball is all inside the domain. The other one is all outside the domain. And they uh, are tangent to the hypersurface at P. Okay, so the picture is very clear. And this uh, uniform radius means that for any point, we can find two balls of this radius, okay? One strictly inside and the other strictly outside, let's say. Okay, and finally, we will, um, yes, of course, we introduce the mean curvature and uh, an important qu quantity is the so-called oscillation. So this is a general, um, a general quantity in uh, the theory of PDE. And in general, the oscillation of a function is the difference between the maximum and the minimum. So in particular, we define the oscillation of the mean curvature as the difference between the maximum of the mean curvature in uh, the hypersurface minus the minimum uh, of the mean curvature in the hypersurface, okay? So this is very important. And um, with these um, preliminaries, I can show you the, the real statement of our result, which is uh, the following. <clears throat> so for every couple of real positive numbers, A0 and rho not, and for every n, so which is the dimension, there exist two constant, two positive constant, epsilon and C, such that if we consider, so as in Alexandrov, a closed embedded hypersurface in uh, one of the three spaces. So let me recall, this is the, hyperbo uh, the um, uh, Euclidean space, the hyperbolic space or the hemisphere, such that we have an upper bound on the area of the hypersurface, a lower bound on the optimal radius. And we have that the, os the oscillation of the mean curvature is less than epsilon then there exists two concentric balls such that the hypersurface is 
inside the difference of the two balls. Okay, of course, this fact is always true, it's trivial. We can always uh, find uh, two balls doing uh, something like this. But the important thing is that we can control the difference of the radii of the two balls in terms of the oscillation. Okay, so the picture is something like this we have. <clears throat> this red one, which is the hypersurface. And here we have the two balls. And uh, as you can see, the hypersurface is inside the difference of the two balls. And the important thing is that we can control this difference, this uh, distance here between the two balls, okay? So this difference here. So, and... Um, this is exactly a um, quantitative version of Alexandrov theorem because, of course, if the mean curvature is constant, then the oscillation is zero. And here we are assuming that the oscillation, the mean curvature is not constant, but is small, so is almost constant in this sense. Okay, so the, os the oscillation is small. And the conclusion is that the hypersurface is close to two balls, one inside and one outside, in this quantitative sense. And um, so the, the important hypothesis is this one, that we have to assume that we have a lower bound on this optimal radius, okay? And later I will comment a little bit on this uh, assumption, but this is the additional hypothesis uh, that we need in order to uh, prevent bubbling phenomena, okay? And um, so about these two bounds, indeed, this, this bound is fundamental, actually, in order to obtain an estimate like this one, okay? While this bound here is related to the value of the two uh, constants in the, in the statement. Okay, so the, the picture related to this uh, theorem is the following. So uh, the first, um, uh, so this kind of result was uh, first proved by uh, Ciraulo and Bezzoni, okay, where they firstly consider the Euclidean, uh, so the case of hypersurface, hypersurfaces embedded in the Euclidean space. Then always um, Ciraulo and Vezzoni consider the case of hypersurfaces embedded in the hyperbolic space. And finally, uh, in collaboration with uh, Giulio Ciraulo and Luigi Vezzoni, we complete the picture for the hemisphere. And uh, also we generalize all the three uh, results uh, for a more general curvature. So, the, as I said in the first lecture, Alexandrov theorem is true not only for the mean curvature, but it's true also for more general functions of the principal curvatures of the hypersurface. And uh, so we extend all the, all the results in the three spaces for these more general um, curvatures. Okay, and I will define later what this HS is. Okay, so a brief um, sketch about the, the related literature to these uh, quantitative studies. So in the Euclidean case, um, there was already uh, quantitative studies for almost constant mean curvature hypersurfaces, but under the assumption that uh, the domain, okay, inside the hypersurface, is, was a convex domain, okay? And here I mentioned some result in this direction and let me emphasize that in our theorem, we do not assume any convexity of the domain, okay? And um, more recently, other almost constant mean curvature hypersurfaces have been studied in, this, um, in these papers, so in particular, Ciraulo Figalli, Maggi Novaga, and Cabré, Foll, Sola Morales, and Beth prove a um, non-local version of um, Alexandrov theorem 
and they prove also a quantitative version of this theorem. In this paper, papers by Krummel, Maggi, and Magnanini and Poggesi, they assume that uh, the mean curvature is close to a constant in some LP norm. Okay. And uh, finally, in this paper by Delgadino, Maggi, Mihaila, and Neumeyer, they prove a uh, weak uh, anisotropic Alexandrov theorem, so a very general <coughs> Alexandrov type theorem. And um, okay, so this is all in the Euclidean space. And of course, in the hyperbolic space, the, the, the study of uh, constant mean curvature hypersurfaces was, um, was done. And here I mentioned some uh, contribution in this direction. And, um, but the, the, the point is that uh, our result is the first quantitative study of almost constant uh, main curvature hypersurfaces in the hyperbolic space and in the hemisphere. Okay. And um, very good. So an important corollary of our um, result is a weaker pinching theorem. So let me recall a classical pinching theorem is something like uh, this one. So if uh, the oscillation of the principal curvatures of the hypersurface is small, then S then the hypersurface is diffeomorphic to a sphere. This is a classical pinching theorem. And um, thanks to our theorem, so under the same hypothesis of our theorem, we can prove the same pinching theorem so that the hypersurface is diffeomorphic to a sphere, provided that the oscillation of the mean curvature is uh, small. And um, so of course this theorem is weaker than this one. Okay, this assumption is weaker than this one. And uh, this is uh, an important consequence, I think. And um, so about the optimality <clears throat> of the result. So um, the, 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 the estimate that we obtain uh, on the difference of the radii is optimal. And uh, moreover, in the um, Euclidean case, um, the, 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 the theorem is optimal in the following sense. It's possible in, in the Euclidean case, it's possible to construct closed hypersurfaces embedded in, the, in R3 mm -hmm. with fixed area, not diffeomorphic to a sphere with the oscillation of the mean curvature arbitrarily small. Okay, so the, the, the example is uh, something like this or this one, this, uh, these hypersurfaces. And um, so, and uh, in, in this case, of course, one can, can put a, a ball inside and a ball outside, but the difference of the radii of the two balls is not small because the oscillation can be arbitrarily small while the difference of the radii is not arbitrarily small, okay? And, um, but the point is that, of course, this, um, for example, this hypersurface does not uh, satisfy the hypothesis of the lower bound on the uh, uniform radius. So the hypothesis rho s bigger or equal than sum rho zero, this is false. And here you can see at these uh, points here, you have problems uh, to, to, to put a ball inside and a ball outside, okay? And so in this sense that the, the theorem is opt optimal. And moreover, in the Euclidean case, Ciraula and Maggi <coughs> uh, proved that if the assumption on the optimal radius is dropped, then the hypersurface is close to a family of pairwise tangent spheres. So in the Euclidean case, if uh, uh, the assumption is dropped, then you are close to something like this. Okay, so the situation is the following in the Euclidean case. And uh, okay. 
So um, what about so quantitative studies? And uh, so as I said in the first uh, lecture, um, a way to prove Alexandrov theorem is by the method of moving planes. And the key ingredients are the strong maximum principle and the Hopf lemma. And uh, another, another way to prove Alexandrov theorem is by integral identities or inequalities. So all the machinery coming from Einstein, Karker, Rilly, and so on, okay, Minkowski, and so on. So to, 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 to perform a quantitative study of the theorem by Alexandrov, one can uh, uh, actually perform a quantitative analysis of the method of moving planes or a quantitative study of the proof based on integral identities, okay? So to prove our theorem, we, um, we use this first, uh, this first analysis. So we uh, use the quantitative, the, the, the method of moving planes in a quantitative way because this um, leads us to the optimality of the estimates and also permits to compute the constant explicitly. Okay, and um, of course here there are arguments uh, coming from the elliptic PV theory. And um, so these are the, 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 quant the quantitative analog of the strong maximum principle, which are these uh, Arnak, Carnerson or boundary Arnak inequality. Okay, so our machine uh, our uh, tools coming from the uh, theory of uh, elliptic PDEs. And uh, I will mention something later. And uh, so what about the, uh, the method of moving planes and the quantitative studies related to the method of moving planes? So as I said, um, the method of moving planes was uh, introduced by Alexandrov and um, later, so after Alexandrov's theorem, the, the, another application of the method of moving planes is the one performed by Serin in 1972. And uh, uh, I will mention the result later, but uh, he applied the, the, the method of moving planes in the context of PD. So in the pure context of elliptic PDs. And um, Okay, let me mention that the, <clears throat> the method of moving planes has several applications. And let me mention that, for example, in the uh, PDE theory, uh, there are these uh, very famous paper and very, very famous results by Gidas Nirenberg and by Caffarelli, Gidas and Sprack, where they prove uh, symmetry properties of solution to second order elliptic PD. And uh, also in the uh, geometric analysis and differential geometry theory by Schoen and also my mix, uh, Korewar, Kuzner and Solomon. So these are very famous uh, papers where the method of moving planes had been uh, used, okay? And of course, many other interesting papers, but um, so we are interested in same result, okay, based on the, uh, and the proof is based on the method of moving planes and the quantitative uh, analog of this result by Serrin uh, is done in this paper by Aftalion, Busca and Reichel in 1999. Okay, and this is the first quantitative study of the method of moving plane. So that's why these uh, results are uh, interesting for us. And uh, so let me mention the theorem by Se the original theorem by Serin and the quantitative version by Aftalion, Busca, and Reichel. So the, this is the Serin's theorem is, uh, is famous in the geometric analysis and PDE's community. So this, um, this theorem deals with uh, bounded domain in the Euclidean space and with a semilinear PDE. So we assume that there exists a positive solution 
to this uh, semi-linear problem. So Laplacian of u plus f of u equals zero inside the domain. And here we have two boundary conditions, okay? Dirichlet boundary conditions, so u equals zero on the boundary. And we assume that the normal derivative is constant on the boundary, okay? And um, so the result by Serrin is the following. If a solution, a positive solution to this problem, to this uh, overdetermined boundary value problem exists, then the domain must be a ball. Okay, so this is a, a characterization of, uh, of balls. And uh, okay, so this is the result. And um, the quantitative counterpart is this one. So as I said, by uh, Aftalion, Busca, and Reichel. So we consider as before a domain and the result is the following. So there exist constants, epsilon and C, and uh, such that if there exists a positive solution satisfying, again, the same semilinear equation in the domain, u equals zero on the boundary. And here we assume, they assume that the normal derivative of u minus a constant is less than epsilon in the C1 norm. So this means that the normal derivative on the boundary is almost constant, okay, in this, uh, in this sense. And um, so what they prove is that under these um, assumptions, then the, the boundary of the domain is uh, uh, between the difference of two boards and they can uh, control the difference of the radii in terms of this uh, uh, deficit, okay, in terms of this smallness. And, um, okay, so here you see that this is the analog of Alexandrov theorem, and this is the analog of our theorem, because here they are assuming that the normal derivative is almost constant, while in Serin's theorem, the, the normal derivative was constant. And in Alexandrov theorem, the mean curvature was constant, in our result, the mean curvature is almost constant, okay? And you can see that the result is similar. The, the estimate is different, but the, 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 the fashion is, is um, similar, okay? Okay, and uh, so let me recall once again the, the, the statement. As I said, we consider a closed hypersurface embedded in uh, Mn plus one. And um, we are able to prove that under an upper bound on the area, a lower bound on the optimal radius, the uniform radius, sorry. And uh, if the oscillation of the mean curvature is small, then we are in this situation, okay? Okay, and... Um, so a very brief uh, sketch of the sketch of the um, of the proof. So we apply uh, the quantitative analysis of the method of moving planes. So we apply the, the method of moving planes as uh, as in the first lecture until we reach uh, the critical position. Okay. Now at the critical position we know that. So remember at the critical position. We have the reflect the hypersurface and the reflection of the cap. And locally, they can be expressed as graphs of two functions, u1 and u2. And um, so remember that before, the mean curvature was constant. So this L of u1 minus u2 was equal to zero. This was a linear um, uniform elliptic PDE. Now the mean curvature is not constant, but is, uh, but uh, nevertheless, this quantity L of u1 minus u2 can be uh, estimated in terms of the oscillation of the mean curvature, okay? And uh, here we apply this uh, famous Arnax inequality, and um, we, we, we obtain that we can estimate the supremum of u1 minus u2 
in terms of the infimum of u1 minus u2 plus of course the oscillation so this term here and uh, this infimum of course is zero okay and um, here we can apply the uh, elliptic regularity theory to obtain this estimate so the estimate is u1 minus u2 in norm c1 they are uh, less than or equal to a constant time the oscillation times the oscillation okay so from this uh, estimate here we uh, can conclude that the two graphs okay so the two hypersurface are close in this c1 sense because remember the, the 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 oscillation is less than epsilon so we are assuming that this is small okay and um, Okay, so from this uh, kind of uh, argument, we can uh, prove that the hypersurface and the reflection of the cap are close near the tangency point. Okay, and they are close in this uh, C1 sense. Okay, now, um, starting from this information, so close to the tangency point, we can propagate this information in order to obtain the approximate symmetry in one direction. Okay, so we can propagate this information from the tangency point to uh, everywhere, let's say. Okay, so we have the approximate symmetry in one direction. And then the idea is to apply this procedure for all directions. So as before, and um, so we, we obtain the approximate symmetry with respect to every direction, with respect to a particular point, which is this uh, calligraphic O. And uh, this point here is, is important because it's defined as the intersection of the n plus one orthogonal, um, uh, sorry, of the n plus one critical hyperplanes, okay, described by the method of moving planes. So they, they have a point of, uh, of intersection and uh, now the, 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 the conclusion is easy because uh, every by construction, every critical hyperplane is close to this point O. And, um, and so we can find the two balls center at this point as in the statement of the theorem, okay? And, um, and the estimate is, is trivially true because every critical hyperplane is, um, is close to this point, okay? It's close to this point, and the, the exact quantity is C times the oscillation, a constant times the oscillation. Okay, so this is uh, the idea, the sketch uh, of the proof. And um, so a final um, remark is the following. So as I said, in the, in the paper in collaboration with uh, Giulio Cirano and Luigi Vezzoni, we uh, extend the, the, the previous result by, results by uh, Cirano and Vezzoni for uh, more general curvatures. Okay, so this HS is a function of the principal curvature of the hypersurface. And um, so this definition can be found in this paper by Korebar. And um, so th these are the, the two assumptions on F. So it's a C2 function is positive when every curve, every principal curvature is positive and is uh, concave on this uh, component gamma of this set, okay? So an important example of this is of course the, 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 the main curvature, but also the um, R higher order curvature of S to the power one over R. Over R. So this, uh, this curvature here satisfies these, uh, uh, these assumptions uh, here. And uh, let me recall that the, our higher order curvature is defined as the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree R in the principal curvature. So the mean curvature is uh, the sum of the principal curvature. And um, while 
the Gauss uh, curvature is the product of the curvature, then we have in between all the possible uh, sums of products of the principal curvature. And uh, so the theorem is true also for these uh, more general uh, curvatures. And um, okay, this is um, everything. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, so let me thank uh, again Hujo for organizing this uh, this festival and for the and for the possibility of of deliver these uh, these two lectures. So thank you and um, bye bye.